This presentation is on protein purification, which is a key step in the downstream processing of protein products. In the words of Ephraim Racker, don't waste clean thinking on dirty enzymes. We purify proteins in order to characterize them, either their function, activity, or structure. We may want to study their regulation and or protein interactions. We may want to use them in an assay or for immunizing animals for the production of antibodies. We can also use the material for creating protein crystals for structure determination or the protein might be used in a clinical study. Starting material for protein purification can be from a variety of sources including organisms found in environmental sources, organs, and other tissues from animals and recombinant proteins. The recombinant proteins can be produced inside the cell or secreted and a variety of tags can be artificially added to the protein to facilitate purification or detection. Proteins have different characteristics that can be used for their purification. These would include the protein solubility, which relates to the conditions under which the protein may precipitate, the size, which can be used to separate proteins of different molecular weights, isoelectric point, which is used in ion exchange chromatography, and specific binding properties used in affinity chromatography. There are different chromatography types which can be leveraged as a purification strategy. The most common strategies which we will review in this lecture include size exclusion, which separates proteins based on their size, ion exchange, which separates proteins based on their charge, and affinity, which separates proteins based on specific binding sites, either naturally occurring or added using a recombinant DNA technology. Less commonly known strategies are hydrophobic interactions, hydroxyapatite, reverse phase, and resins with chemicals or dyes linked. Hydrophobic interactions works, as its name suggests, by separation of proteins based on their hydrophobicity, which is a function of the number of aliphatic residues they have in overall structure. Reverse phase refers to the fact that the stationary phase of the resin is hydrophobic and not hydrophilic, as is the case in normal phase chromatography. It is similar in operation as hydrophobic interactions chromatography. Hydroxyapatite resins contain a form of calcium phosphate that can be used in the separation of proteins in DNA. Chemicals and dyes may also be used, but they have specificity for certain classes of proteins. There are different chromatography systems available and, depending on the process, will be used with smaller or larger columns. The most basic system shown here consists of a pump and detectors. Some systems can have multiple pumps, which are used with two or more different buffers used in the process. The detectors are typically a UV detector to measure protein, as well as a conductivity and pH detector. Systems will also have a fraction collector to collect different subsets of the chromatogram over time. A sample loop is critical for injecting sample onto the chromatography resin. Systems also have monitors that will cause an alarm if, for instance, there is too much pressure and can automatically turn off the system to prevent damage. One critical part of these systems is the injection valve. The injection valve is a critical part of the chromatography system. It usually has three settings, load, inject, and waste. The load setting means that the sample loop is out of the flow path and can be loaded. The valve can switch to inject so that the sample loop is in the flow path and material in the sample loop goes to the column. In the waste setting, buffer does not flow to the column or through the sample loop but bypasses the system and goes directly to waste. This setting is useful for changing out buffers when different procedures are being run. Columns for chromatographic separations can come either as pre-packed or can be packed into empty columns, as shown here. For research scale work, columns from 1.6 to 5 centimeters in diameter are typically used. 
These empty columns may need a specialized reservoir to fit all of the resin to be packed as this comes diluted in a storage buffer and a pump system must be applied to pack the resin into the column. Prepack columns come in a wide range of sizes with the most common being either 5 milliliter or 1 milliliter. There is also a wide range of functionality available which includes all chromatography modalities. In order to connect columns to the chromatography systems, fittings are used. These are either sized using the metric system or imperial system, which are not compatible. Threads are sized based on number of turns per inch and width of the thread. A common size is 1032, where 32 denotes the threads per inch. Fittings usually consist of a threaded part and a corresponding nut. There are also adapters to connect parts together and to other types of fittings such as a lure type used to connect to syringes. One commonly used chromatography type is size exclusion chromatography. If we consider the four proteins in the upper right, they all enter the column at the same time, but smaller proteins get trapped inside the resin which slows down their transit through the column. If we look at the final result from running the chromatography, we see that the largest protein eluded first, followed by the two 20 kilodon proteins and the 5 kilodon protein last. The graph shown here is called a chromatogram and shows the elution pattern over time by displaying the A280 signal, which measures the protein level as discussed before. Fractions collected over time allow samples to be physically separated so they can be analyzed and processed later. Another common type of chromatography is ion exchange. In this type of chromatography, resins are functionalized with chemicals that impart either a positive or a negative charge on the protein. If we consider our four proteins, each will have a different charge depending on the isoelectric point and pH of the solution they are in. Proteins will be negatively charged at pHs above their pi and positively charged at pHs below their pi. In the example shown, the resin is positively charged and will bind negatively charged proteins. During the process, the positively charged proteins don't bind and move out of the resin during a wash cycle. For the bound proteins, a salt solution is applied. The negatively charged chloride ions will displace the proteins bound to the resin by outcompeting for binding sites on the resin. Proteins with more negative charge will loot later than those with PIs closer to the pH of the solution. Affinity chromatography takes advantage of a natural property of the protein or a tag to bind to a ligand attached to the resin. In the example, one protein has the tag while all of the other proteins do not. The tag protein binds to the column and the other proteins are washed away. Finally, the tag protein is eluded from the resin by using a chemical that outcompetes the protein for binding to the resin. For elution, an elution buffer is employed. The buffer is applied to the column in what is called a gradient. There are two types of gradients. A step gradient is where the concentration of the elution buffer is changed instantaneously relative to the initial buffer. A linear gradient is where the elution buffer is changed more gradually over time. As shown in this example, for each step, a certain number of column volumes are run. A column volume is the total volume inside of the column that houses the resin. So if 10 column volumes of a 5 milliliter column are run, then that means 50 milliliters, or 10 times 5 milliliters of elution buffer, also known as buffer B, is run over the column. Each step can result in different populations eluding from the column with a final wash to remove anything that is still bound to the column, then a drop back to the starting buffer concentration to re-equilibrate and start over. For a linear gradient, the buffer B is changed gradually over time, usually 10 to 20 column volumes, and the gradient does not have to end at 100% B, but can go to other concentrations of elution buffer. Usually a high salt wash of 100% B is run at the end of the chromatography 
prior to re-equilibration of the column. Affinity chromatography is used in research and manufacturing labs. Many proteins have what is known as a 6x his tag, which means six histidines in a row. Proteins that have this feature will bind to divalent cation metals like nickel bound to immobilized metal affinity columns or IMAC. Other resins can have antibodies specific for a certain protein, or antibodies themselves can be purified using protein A, G, or L, which are naturally occurring proteins specific for these antibody proteins. Other tags include maltose binding protein, or MVP, flag, and MIG tags, which are short peptides that are bound by specific antibodies. IMAC resins have a nickel molecule bound to a nitriloacetate molecule, which coordinates the metal on the resin. The histag protein will bind at this site. Histag proteins have a strong affinity for the nickel NTA and thus bind to the resin as shown in this figure. In order to elute the bound protein, another chemical that competes for binding to the nickel is used. Most commonly, imidazole is used in the elution buffer at concentrations of 200 to 1000 millimolar. The reason why imidazole is used is because it mimics the structure of histidine and thus can compete for binding to the nickel molecule. Switching gears, protein yield, or how much protein we recover from the purification, is dependent on several factors, including the type of resin use, as well as what type of protein we are trying to purify. Other factors that affect yield include concentration of the protein, how stable it is at different temperatures, how long it is stored, and the buffer formulation it is stored in. Other considerations when performing purifications will include incorporating different techniques for each purification step. This means not using the same chromatography modality, such as two size exclusion columns in a row. In addition, it is important to minimize handling between steps and complete the entire process in as little time as possible. Other things to consider would be to minimize additives that could interfere with assays and finally, try to keep the process as simple as possible to minimize total time and maximize yield. One strategy that is employed in biomanufacturing is the capture step. This is typically done with ion exchange resins and is a quick way to concentrate and remove bulk water and other impurities that don't bind to the resin. Intermediate purifications can then be run utilizing a different modality such as hydrophobic interactions, which takes advantage of different hydrophobicity characteristics of the proteins. Other techniques could include a subtractive chromatography, where the protein doesn't bind to one type of resin, such as cation, but other impurities do, then protein can be immediately bound to an anion exchange resin where it will bind. Finally, polishing steps get proteins to high purity. They can utilize size exclusion or ion exchange due to the high resolution of certain resins. Samples may also need to be changed into a different buffer, either by precipitating the protein and working it up in a new buffer, or by diafiltration and ultrafiltration, as we will talk about in other videos. After the purification process is complete, a purification table should be made to document results. This table will include all steps and display how much protein was removed during the process, as well as how much activity, in the case of enzymes, was lost. The specific activity is a measure of how much of the protein activity is derived from the protein mixture. This is calculated by dividing the activity by the total protein amount. Specific activity will increase as the protein becomes more pure. The yield is a measure of how much activity was lost and is displayed as a percentage by dividing the remaining protein by the starting protein and multiplying by 100. The full purification relates to how much the specific activity has changed over time and is calculated by dividing the specific activity at each step by the initial specific activity. For example, the initial specific activity for this purification is 0.84 and the final is 30, 
So dividing 30 by 0.84 gives us the final full purification of 35.7. Once proteins are purified, or sometimes in the middle of the process, the proteins will need to be quantified and analyzed. This will be covered in another video, but the two main ways to analyze proteins are using spectrophotometry and SDS page, which give an estimate of total protein and protein purity, respectively. There are other techniques which will be used to assess quality, such as ELISA and cell-based assays.